I just wanted to give a quick uh, introduction to the people that will be giving presentations and expanding on, the, on these topics. So we have uh, some of the experts in the field. So um, on the actual uh, thunderstorm generator, and even though you might not believe it, this, when I had to boil it down to what it was doing, and to simplify for an internal combustion engine, and I appreciate Justin brought this, his, this is something that somebody else uh, in this community built and brought it here, and the reason it's on stage is because it's never had petrol in the petrol tank and it hasn't got any oil in it. So we're actually occupational health and safety safe. So, uh, so what I'll do is I'll bring people up, because what we've, we've got going at the moment is research globally, and uh, uh, George Lush, uh, these uh, are basically mimicking the two spirals. All you've got is, here you can see a left spiral and a right spiral, what you've got, the exhaust coming out, and there's no straight lines in the universe. Every line's a curve, and every curve's part of a spiral, and that spiral is either imploding or exploding. To put it bluntly, our technology has gone the wrong way. We've used explosive technology, which nature does not use. And so what this is attempting to do, this is an implosive turbine. It has no axle. The air comes in and does the spinning and the thrust. So and in this case, uh, to get this to work, you have to make a home for the plasmoids, which are variously known in history as the, uh, uh, going back, King Solomon, uh, it was called the Shamir. If you go back to Sanskrit text, it's the, the, this is the Vajra, and what it fires is ball lightning, which is the Vidrit, V-I-D-Y-U-T. <coughs> and I thank uh, Praveen for giving me, uh, Praveen, are you here? Is that somewhere? <laughs> so anyway, um, for, for giving the, that uh, language. So basically we'll be demonstrating this uh, machine. We have it on a, uh, 3100 Chevy, 1955 Series 2. Uh, that will be, we've retrofitted this. But uh, because it's all based on resonant frequency and uh, because the people I wanted to introduce, first of all, um, uh, Rory, are you here? Yep. So Rory was, when I first had this imagination, <laughs> Rory was in Laguna Beach, so you just give a short uh, summary of that. Yeah. Years ago, uh, I, a friend of mine was uh, managing a shop that was connected to uh, an oil dr drilling guy that was connected to Malcolm, and I uh, was coming up the stairs, my friend's like, you got to meet this guy. And I see Malcolm there, and he's got all these papers spread out, and he's just downloading and channeling all this knowledge, and uh, it's a long story, but I uh, wound up having him come and stay at my place for a few weeks, and we wound up, you know, going around to different, you know, art supply stores getting all the, the bits and pieces to make some of the early models and concepts and uh, yeah it's just uh, it, you know we had a making this out of you know construction paper you know we had about four people all with their hands in it trying to hold it get it in the right place and uh, and then it was just kind of one download after the other you know we had uh, you know there was the, oh, the, yes. the, the, the time the time crystals here uh, which I'm still wrapping my head around this stuff you know t ten years later um, but there's, uh, you know, it was just really w one thing after the other. He was, you know, he was just really getting all these downloads from between the, the engine, the unification model, the time crystals, and, uh, you know, just we, we kept in contact over the years uh, via email, and we actually hadn't talked since about 2017, and then, uh, you know, sitting there working one night on a, had podcasts on autopilot, and all of a sudden I hear in the, the back of my, you know, I just hear something, I was like, that's something Malcolm would say. And I look up on the screen, and there's the model, and I was like, whoa, that's Malcolm's model. And I look at the, the title, and it's Randall Carlson talking about the Joe Rogan controversy. And I was like, what is going on here? What's Malcolm been up to? And, uh, and so uh, a couple more months went by, and then saw the Tesla Tech uh, demonstration, and so I drove out to Albuquerque and got reconnected, and yeah, it's been a wild ride ever since. Okay, thanks, mate. Okay, Jiro. So that gives a bit of history for you. It's been a long, long journey. <laughs> and there's a lot of people uh, who've assisted, and I thank all of them now, take the opportunity, uh, really, and standing on the shoulders of giants, a lot of people sacrificed a lot and are still sacrificing a lot. 
my main goal here, so everyone understands, is simply, I know, and I have great appreciation to Bob Grinier and, and his work and support and the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. And I did have a, the honour to meet with Martin Fleischmann and I did promise him to the best of my ability that I would help, you know, like, uh, basically restore his name and finish what he started. So, thank you. That's it, I got, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, George. Um, so anyway, so um, John Eschmeyer, are you here at all? I was hoping, that, oh, John, can you just come up? This is my story. You might have heard that I, was, I took the decision to risk my life and infuse myself with plasmoids. The man that supervised that, and these are all people from a decade ago. I disappeared on my island for seven years. And you can't believe that everyone's just come back together again. It's gone full circle. So I think that I'd like to thank, uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of work. So <laughs> and it's the first time we've met for 10 years. Yeah, so, so, so and, and I'd just like to bring John up here because a, a lot of people I just want to validate the history of the story. And I'll give a summary of that, but just a, a quick you know, one minute thing was just uh, I said to John, he could come up and just say, yes, the machine that I went in, where you can see your acupuncture points and you can see the, the, the actual uh, streams of poison coming out of your body. And uh, John's been working on, uh, Guy Belinsky and John originally put the machine together. Uh, John supervised over a three month period my infusion when I could keep taking it. <laughs> and so now he's, he can tell you he's, he's in the process, almost finished, recreating that machine, write it clearly so others may follow. So therefore there is a path to infuse yourself with plasmoids and yeah. As Malcolm said, it's been a long, Long, long trip. I started working on this project, I was asked by Guy Obolinski, <clears throat> that some of you may know his name and some may not. He was the original reinventor of what he called at the time phaser technology, which was using uh, scalar wave technology and superluminal shock waves to create cold plasma and, <clears throat> excuse me, ignite a room that had, um, was an environmentally stable room, specific humidity and temperatures and so forth. Ignite that room and the vapor in that room into a cold plasma form. That cold plasma form communicates with your physiology and the water in your body and you find any inflammation that one has is reduced. And when I was asked by Obolinsky to help him finish it because he said I won't live forever, I took a look at it and having had a history of taking projects that were impossible and making them work, mostly just because if someone says it can't be done, then I got to do it. I looked at it and I said, okay, I figure about two years I can do this. Well, we started this down this road in 2005. So <laughs> if nothing else, I've endured. But as Malcolm said, we are right at the edge of defining the specifications for reproduction. And uh, if there was ever a time in history that that's needed, it's now. So with that, I'll okay. let Thanks, go back at it. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. I'll see you at five. Yeah. 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 As I said, standing on the shoulders of giants, and I'd just like to uh, also just be, be keeping on, uh, I think uh, there's uh, George Lush. Is George here? No, Lush, is that, is it, uh, sorry, we might have to go with someone else, but uh, I thought George might be around. 
But uh, George Lush, just to say, it was the one that uh, infused, made these, the metal by annealing it and then pressure uh, clinching it. And George has been more to that. But he's been the one that's been doing the work on this. As got, and he can speak to himself for the aerospace industry. Oh dear. Briefly. Uh, yeah. The whole aerospace industry just in five seconds. In 30 seconds, <laughs> yeah. So we, we do the heat treatment um, for a lot of companies. And one client approached me saying, look, I've got this guy. I don't really understand it. Can you have a look? Can we come over for half an hour? So that was a four hour meeting. And it's just gone on from there. Um, and it's just a hundred layers of, right, well, that's more things I don't know and understand. Um, the heat treatment I understand, but it's just evolving all the way. And that's been about the last 18 months or so. Um, just learning all the time just more and more stuff. Yeah, that shows what I know. <laughs> and, right, and, and, that shows what I know. Yeah, so and so uh, George will be giving a talk. We've done the th he did the thermal analysis, because that's his specialty in annealing, the thermal analysis of the metal. And what we're trying to do in his work is when you release this, if you have a, you need a cube, right? that the plasmoid sits in the center of. And that cube has to be perfect. If you have any stress in the metal, and we stress this metal several times, because so what we normally do is, is you take a, a, a stainless steel and then you anneal it so that there's no stress in it from manufacture. Then you spin it so that it has, uh, like it has reels on it. So, and then you uh, take it and anneal it again and then you weld the assembly together, such as this, and then you put it in and anneal it again. Now, what, uh, God bless him, and rest in peace, Martin Fleischmann said to me, he said, Malcolm, spend six months preparing the metal properly, yeah, and one hour getting your result. Do not spend <laughs> six, you know, um, months trying to get a result after you've done one hour of metal preparation because the homes have to be perfect for the plasmoids to seat into. If they're perfect homes and if you anneal them properly, they will go to the centre and they will sit there and they will uh, gather charge. Once they're in the, bedded in the metal, we've found we've used a thunderstorm generator eight years after it's been embedded, hasn't been used, we put it on the machine, immediately it works, right? Without even having the, uh, the, the water assembly or anything turned on for about 20 minutes while it discharges and then you need to turn this on again to charge it. So that's, uh, thanks. Are you done with me? Yep, I think so. I'll go with <laughs> <you>. <laughs> right. And so the reason, I apologise, the reason I'm, I'm introducing these people is because they're going to have lectures in our separate room and we will be doing this uh, from this afternoon with the, uh, the engine and the, the car, the Chevy, uh, that people can have a look at. We've got our, our full demonstration there. Uh, but basically, uh, then, um, I think with, uh, uh, we've got uh, 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 Jordan quickly, is that, is that see? So actually, we might just go to Sheila and pay her um, thing, because it's all about resonant frequency. And what the model of the elements, which we can see here, is all about realising that time itself is a paradox, because on your clock you have 24 hours and zero hours, you have 360 degrees and zero degrees. When I realised that paradox, I realised I could line up everything here, but because it's, Tesla said, you know, energy and vibration. So, so basically, um, this uh, Sheila's done some uh, some actual uh, frequency. In fact, you can point to the <laughs> the line they've done. But uh, and she'll just run a short thing because she'll be doing a full uh, as as um, uh, George Lush will be doing a full presentation on it. Uh, Sheila will be doing a full presentation on it. But she's got a short now that you might be interested in. Yeah. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Sheila. I'm a sound engineer and a frequency researcher, and I've dedicated my life to studying coherent frequencies and sonic geometries. And I started off with 
analyzing the 432 tuning system and into oscilloscopes. So visualizing the coherence of the geometry in the oscilloscope. And, and then my research expanded when I started looking into the ancient Indian and Vedic tuning systems and finding that these geometries were giving me even more coherent geometries. And then I started analyzing the frequencies in the plasmoid unification model right over here, and I found some really alien geometries, really beautiful, incredible geometries in the oscilloscope. And I'm so excited to give you guys a presentation later on in the Moorhead room in the back, and I'll explain exactly the process of how we take any numerical sequence and we can convert that into its corresponding sine tones. Then we take the sine tones and then we play them and we can hear them oscillate as well as pure sine tones. And then we can take those sine tones and visualize them through an oscilloscope. And we can take it even further and take those sonic geometries and there's a wide variety of applications for those. For example, imprinting the electromagnetic field with a rodent coil or imprinting the plasma field with a quantify or a Dan Winters Therify. So there is an enormous amount of applications for these new geometries and yeah, the ones in the plasmoid unification model are incredible. Um, there's about 16 different lines that I converted into different tuning systems. So for example, if you take line 14, you take line 14 in the plasmoid unification model, there's about, there's exactly 32 frequencies. So I mapped all 32 of those frequencies to an external MIDI controller. The MIDI controller has knobs and faders, so you can basically fade in each individual frequency while you visualize the geometry on the screen. So I feel like every school should have this. It's very educational in terms of understanding the correspondence between sound and movement mapped in um, the polar coordinates system in the oscilloscope. So check out my lecture later. <laughs> All right, so, so you're going to run your you're going to run your video. Yeah, we are able to run the video. So this is a little demonstration. This is line 14 of the plasmoid unification model and. I'm just fading in and out each frequency. That particular sequence was line 14 of the plasmoid unification model. So all 13 of those frequency values were input into the MIDI controller and I'm slowly fading each one in and out and you can observe amazing geometries coming through. So line 14, line 14 is light. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. So um, I, th I thought it's appropriate, uh, Bob, we just want to do a short uh, um, summary 
maybe for, you know, I really appreciate Bob and the Mark Flush Moore project has said, you know, we're just earnestly trying to seek the truth about plasma and plasmoids and, uh, you know, it's been a wild journey. We've been all around the world. <laughs> so I don't probably, you know, so. Hi, my name is Bob Greenio. I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. And I have to say, I didn't want to get involved with this. I didn't. And uh, we were, as a project, we were looking into the GEET, the Global Environmental Energy Technology. This has been replicated by a number of people. It's notoriously difficult to replicate. But there was a couple of things that really interested me. One was the potential for nuclear transmutation that was going on. And the other one was these kind of flashes of something, like sprites coming out of some independent replications of these devices. And so we, we were doing some experiments in Holland and uh, in Canada and other places we were getting interested in this. And, you know, our organization is set up to test the claims of third parties. And in some cases, that's been extremely difficult. And I've, I've said this quite often recently. I think Malcolm is one of the easiest claimants I've ever had to work with and the projects had to work with and uh, and it's been fun at times it's been difficult at other times but um, what we what what happened was is someone sent me a video from an experiment about eight years ago where there was what I call coherent matter traveling waves coming out of the steel and going back into the steel and I said oh god now I have to get involved <laughs> <laughs> so I said, all right. Um, so someone that was doing the testing here in North Carolina reached out, and I had a conversation for about 50 minutes whilst they were driving to the lab, right? Because uh, they didn't have a clue what was going on. I said, well, based on this one image, it looks like these are breaking down ball lightning, and it's the coherent matter that's in the ball lightning that's coming out. And it's able to come back, and it goes to the yang of the yin or the yin of the yang. It's, it's going through, and it, it, because it doesn't have necessarily a charge, but it does interact with... with gases, you get this luminous thing going through the air. Um, but so then what I respect about Malcolm, he's a man in the arena. Whether it turns out to do all of the claims, I don't care. Actually, what I care about is can this clean the gases in a similar way, at least to what a catalytic converter does, uh, but just using $30 of steel, let's say. Um, in a way that allows it to be attached to a $1,700 rickshaw in India and to clean up the cities in the subcontinent and in Asia. So if we can achieve that, um, that would be absolutely fantastic and a credit to the work that Malcolm's done. Thanks, so I have no idea whether it's actually going to do that, but what I do know <laughs> is that um, Malcolm has never restricted what we could do He's never asked to see a presentation I would make or had a, a, a right of veto on anything that I would say. Uh, he probably regrets that to a degree, but anyway. <laughs> Full credit for him to do that, and that is a difficult thing for a claimant to do. Um, so in, in the conference in Zurich, I said that potentially it was based in part on the electrostatic uh, Armstrong electrostatic boiler, and this was a device that was able to produce nearly two uh, feet, uh, 1.9 rough million volts of electric discharge, long before either the Tesla coil or the Van de Graaff generator was made. And uh, this is the sort of disruptive discharge before the Tesla disruptive discharge. And this is just where you get like a high temperature thing and you pass water into it and the, the water flashes to steam. You get this charge separation, and these incredible voltages produced. And so it looked like it might be doing something like that. And given the fact that it was producing these signatures that we had observed in the lab and replicated in, in between labs, um, uh, that it was like ball lightning, I said in my presentation in Zurich that if this is ball lightning, it has the potential to do nuclear transmutation, but what you see um, is uh, going to have a route that will have these things called iron-rich crenelated microspheres. And you might recognize those from meteorite air bursts. Uh, these are the things that you see in the younger Dryas layers. And uh, when I started uh, saying this, uh, George got very upset. He says, there's all kinds of things. <laughs> that He doesn't want to have all kinds of things that produce these things. And I said, well, if you have a, a meteorite coming in and it produces a plasma and you've got massive hydrodynamic shear, you're going to get magnetohydrodynamic structures and these will synthesize these same things. The iron actually may be coming 
from the meteorite itself, but it organizes these signature structures. And so I said, look, you know, um, Malcolm was looking at this 24-inch sphere that apparently had run for 500 hours over eight years. And uh, I said, Malcolm, he was sending me these pictures of him te tearing it apart. I said, Malcolm, wrap it up. Don't do anything. You might be contaminating it. And uh, can I come over? And so I got the next plane over, and I brought some macro uh, cameras and microscopes, and Johanna James was pulled in, and she manned some, some cameras, and I was doing the others. And it had these hexagonal and pentagonal uh, carbon-like look deposits on the inside of the outside and, and the kind of uh, the opposite type structure, which were also polygonal on the inside uh, uh, of the structure. And this looked like work that was presented by the nuclear scientist, Dr. Takaaki Matsumoto, who I visited last year and sadly passed away. And he, uh, this showed that potentially he really was having kind of the same kind of magnetohydrodynamic structures forming. So I said, Malcolm, you're now going to have to chop this up and give me a sample to put on the SEM. You didn't like that, did you? <laughs> he said, I want this in the Smithsonian. <laughs> uh, anyway, he relented after about a day. And he sent uh, Kyan over with, with some samples, due credit for him to take the one-day round trip like I did the previous couple of days ago. And I put it on the SEM, I recorded the SEM session live, and within a few seconds we found the iron-rich crenelated microspheres, regularly arranged and potentially vast numbers of them. Now, the question is, would you put something on your engine that had these plasma things coming out and in that looked like plasma? I don't know whether you would want to do that. But um, it's, 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 uh, I think it might be a continuum from catalyst, catalysis of chemical reactions through nuclear reactions through to baryon decay. Um, I don't know whether we're getting that far down the story. And is it doing catalysis? That would be great. A cleaner burn is what I'm after. I hope that Malcolm is able to achieve it. I respect him for being able to put this out openly and for people like the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project and other people to test his claims. That takes a lot of courage. If there's one thing this man has, he has courage. So thank you, Malcolm, for being a man in the arena. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to do that uh, introductions because if you want to follow down the, any of those paths, but the uh, people will be doing lectures, you can see the obviously the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. You can see uh, with the uh, alchemical science with Jordan. Uh, you can follow up all that stuff. As I said, there'll be lectures. I'll just go through quickly uh, why I wanted to bring this together is that it has many applications. The, the takeaway from this conference is that with the test work we've done and, and with uh, the observations that ball lightning produces crenolite ion spheres, and that's a, a marker for this technology. And the fact that we got uh, you know, um, enough sample in our devices to be able to test and do um, isotope work, which is ongoing, but you know, the initial tests uh, indicate that we're headed in the right direction and we'll keep on doing that testing. And uh, we uh, certainly, uh, with the engines that we have here that you'll see, we have three different gas analyzers. There's, this is an independent, I did not build this. There was a, uh, uh, a person that came with the um, gas analyzer and this engine. And so um, that is, you know, it's great that people are replicating that and we'll be doing the test work over you know, Sunday and Monday. So I invite everyone to come and have a look at that. And so basically, and also I just want to say that with the poster that's at the front there and with this book, uh, they're available. I think, Randall, uh, you, you've ta got some posters. Um, it's Cosmographica, is that Randall? With, on, yeah, Cosmographica. Howto.com and Cosmographica, yeah. So, so what I might do is, um, oh, back here at the store, thank you, yeah. And, and these are my notes, um, which obviously seven, well, 50 years work, but seven years just writing them up. And basically they're all color coded and it's all about dimensions and time and uh, rewriting mass physics and chemistry uh, in a way that uh, is unique and sort of relating it to the universe. And what I say is that what uh, my grade six teacher said, Malcolm, don't bother 
you know, I was 12 years old, wanting to build a car that ran on water. He said, well, you never do that unless you can solve this, this mystery, this puzzle about how is everything unified. What this model does is unify uh, basically um, not only frequencies, which you're able to then visualize, but also it unifies all things. So in here, you've got uh, crystal form, color, uh, sound, uh, you've got uh, the great year, which is 25920, 25,000, 20 years, which is the moon travels its own diameter every hour. That's, that's the moon's traveling distance in uh, 12 hours. And you've got down here hydrogen, which is more correctly known as should be protein, but it's 2592. So what you're saying is distance and time, you can see that they're the same uh, metric and they swap over when you have uh, you know, furlongs, uh, cubits and inches and the sacred geometry. And that's why uh, I reached out to Randall because you need that metric to be able to um, be able to uh, put things together. If you understand how things are put together, you can understand how things can be pulled apart. And with uh, Sheila's work is great because you can actually then visualize it. So I think that the, uh, uh, we'll probably move on to uh, the, uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, a video, I'm not sure how we're doing for time there at the moment. But um, if you could put the, uh, play that video, thank you. By imploding a sphere and putting the North Pole, which is rotating anti-clockwise, against the South Pole, which is rotating clockwise, you create a monopolar point on the equatorial plane. Segmenting the imploded sphere into eight planes creates 16 peripheral points, which when viewed in cross-section reveal the infinity symbol. In order to calculate the resonant frequency of any shape, you must first calculate the sum of its internal angles. To calculate the resonant frequency of an imploded sphere, we must produce the sum of the internal angles contained within all eight planes. The eight planes contain two circles, 360 degrees plus 360 degrees. These are connected by intersecting angles of 90 degrees and 90 degrees. When multiplied by the eight planes, we arrive at 7,200 degrees. All physical shapes vibrate at the sum of their internal angles, which are determined by the base angle of 22.5 degrees and its octaves. The angle between the eight planes and the zero-point equatorial centre also determines the location of the knot and nodes on the Fibonacci phi curve on the pi surface. This connects and defines the placement of all the elements. We start with a 100 pi surface area imploded sphere. Divided into eight planes, creating 16 points on the circumference, 22.5 degrees apart. The Sanskrit Fibonacci curve on the 100 pi surface connects the eight planes. Each intersection of the eight planes in the Sanskrit Fibonacci curve defines the elemental points. These elemental points are knobs and nodes that can be defined by a triangle formed from the point of the intersection between the 100 pi surface and the Sanskrit Fibonacci curve on one of the eight planes. This triangle extends from the node down to the torus equatorial plane and then at 90 degrees to the central zero point. The zero center is the collision point of the north and south poles opposite spirals. This cancels out the spin and therefore the AC frequency replacing it with a DC singularity zero point. This 345 triangle displays the ratios of zero matter to light and light to matter. From the area of the triangle defined by this right triangle with the ratios of 3 to 4 to 5, we are able to calculate the resonant frequency of Thank the you. element. This is done by dividing the ATV by time. Okay, yep. So I just uh, explain that uh, we might, I don't know whether we can take the video back a bit to the, um, I can explain from there. So, so basically what you have is, to create this shape, and we had, that's it, no, no, just forward a little bit more, like we go back to the, the circle with the hash on it, just take it forward a little bit, thank you, sorry, a little technical glitch, I did just want to stop there and say that, that what I did was in that, this, making the circle and putting a grid on it, you're able to cut that circle uh, at 90 degrees and get a cube, you cut the circle at 45 degrees, you'll get a, uh, a, um, a pyramid up and a pyramid down, a mirror image. And, but if you cut it at 22 and a half degrees, you get this shape, which uh, we haven't seen before. So this is a big uh, revolutionary thing. This is 22 and a half degrees. And uh, this is, uh, you're 11, 
uh, sorry, this is the opposite way around. The 22 and a half degrees and the 11.25 degrees, they actually create the same shape from the fundamental uh, basics of simply uh, do, drawing a circle, putting an eight by eight square inside it, cutting it 90 degrees, folding it in on itself. So it's, it's you, you uh, take it as being an octave, an eighth of a circle. So, and that, so that's first principle to produce these shapes. The resonant shapes is how I think in form and function. And so uh, the, going back to how you can generate these shapes on first principle is important along with the unification model to understand about how the universe you know, runs. And this is uh, what I call the time crystal because it's an imploding sphere and it's got uh, the 22 and a half times 16 is your 360 degrees, so it's a fundamental uh, truth, yeah? So um, I'm not sure, uh, I suppose we could go, uh, are we able to run that video or we've, we've run out of? E to four to five, we are able to calculate the resonant frequency of the element. This is done by dividing the ATV by time. The area time volume, or ATV, is the product of the ratios between the 3, 4, 5 triangle. This allows us to visualize a proportional concept and is equivalent to a parable. It is not the exact truth, but it is the story that enables us to understand the underlying principle of the familial and group relationships between zero matter, light, and matter. The model of the elements describes the parable of family relationships that exist between zero matter, light, matter, sound, crystal form, positive and negative charge, paramagnetic disposition, and form. The ATV represents the resonance of the elemental point, its charge density, and therefore its gravity. Gravity is the inverse relationship of an osmotic effect, which is created by a lower charge density element, defined by alternating current, being attracted towards the higher charge density of a singularity zero point, representing direct current. The ATV illustrates the elemental charge density by representing the area that the fixed charge occupies. The elemental resonance is equivalent to and defined by the melting point of the element, which is defined by the ATV triangle area. When the resonance is divided by time, represented by 24 hours, 60 minutes, 60 seconds, and normalized with the speed of light using a factor of 7.5, this produces the rectified base resonant frequency. This is important because once you know the resonant frequency of an element, you have the metric with which to manipulate matter, as demonstrated by the figures of Chaldi. When all the elemental nodes are plotted according to their valences, the elements correctly align to their base frequencies. These base frequencies, which are also defined by sound and color, are indicated for each of the eight planes of the model. The eight planes also indicate the monad, dyad, triad, and tetrad crystal forms of the elements. The underlying ground plane on which the torus is placed accurately defines their positive and negative elemental charge. This ground plane also demonstrates the paramagnetic and diamagnetic character of the elements. The disposition of the sorted elements once correctly placed across the torus model, according to their octave progression, take on their unique planes of reference. The noble gases which are classified as inert occur on the same plane. Hydrogen is also a gas and occurs at the zero point of that plane which is the point of greatest charge density. Hydrogen, therefore, has the greatest charge density of any element. The octave model defines the relationship between the frequency and crystal form in order to enable the reconciliation between zero matter, time, light, and matter. It is a proportional representation of the infolding and warping of time and space. As the model of the elements defines the location upon the pi surface that each element will report to, the octave model allows for the visualization of the charge density, crystal form, and resonance of each element. This model is capable of defining and quantifying the eight-shell internal structure of each atom. The octave model, which represents one-eighth of a sphere, visualizes the musical octaves, the relationship to their crystal forms, and their 22.5 degree primary, 45 degree secondary, and 90 degree tertiary spatial dimensional relationships. The octave model, when folded, demonstrates the alteration of the area time volume as it metamorphoses from the high charge density fifth dimension to the low charge density first dimensional base. The new shape derived from the base 22.5 degree angle is the translate representing the relationship between direct current, which is zero matter, and alternating current, which is matter.
Rectifying the zero matter, which operates on a base of 12, and matter, which operates on a base of 16, is essential to any torus spiral collision based fusion device capable of operating at room temperature or above. This principle is demonstrated by the operation of our plasmoid thunderstorm generator. In order to achieve this rectification, you must first divide the one dimensional zero matter circle into 16 points, spaced 22.5 degrees apart, to create the two dimensional zero matter circle. This represents the transition from the infinite zero matter circle to the finite matter square. When you join the 16 points on the circumference of the circle to their equal and opposite mirror points, you create two large squares, four small squares, two large rectangles, and eight small rectangles. This is a total of 16 cuboids generated from a 16-segment sphere. This represents the proportional translation between zero matter and matter. From this, one can calculate both the sphere and the volumes of the cuboids within the sphere. The plasmoid thunderstorm generator was conceived as a demonstrable proof of the ability to create charge and discharge plasmoids based on the model of the elements and the octave dimensional model. The major components of this system are a frequency imprinting device which acts through ionization to precondition the frequency of the air. This airstream is drawn into a pulsed vacuum through a body of water which promotes the creation of plasmoids through the collapse of cavitation bubbles. The pre-ionized air amplifies the atomic effect as it is resonant with the frequency generated by the zero point of a collapsing cavitation bubble. These plasmoids are then drawn into the center of the thunderstorm machine, which counteropposes hot dry exhaust gas from an internal combustion engine against moist cold air induced by a vacuum created by the same motor. This creates free electrons which are then captured by the plasmoids. These electrons are stored by the structuring of the plasmoid, which has the capacity not only to store the electrons, but also to share them with the plasmoid swarm, so as the swarm can maintain a base resonant frequency. This is an effect governed by the fact that the plasmoids actually increase physically in size, directly altering their individual resonant frequency. The plasmoid group's homostasis demands that the frequency remains the same for an individual as it is for the group. Therefore, the individuals must share the electrons equally. Eight thermocouples were attached to the key points on the plasmoid thunderstorm generator to quantify the anomaly between the heat energy received from the exhaust and the heat generated by the thunderstorm device. The heat of the thunderstorm generator exceeds the heat of the input exhaust, proving an anomalous above unity condition. I think we'd stop it there, thank you. So just, uh, so that gives a nice summary um, of 50 years work. First of all, defining what the relationship between ether and matter is, and that the sun is, in my opinion, a frequency imprinting device, as this uh, is the same in that the radius of the sun is 432. There's a four inch sphere, a three inch sphere, and a two inch sphere. So basically, that's the North Pole, and that's the South Pole. Add them together as 864, the diameter of the sun. The amount of seconds in a day is 86,400, the same number. The moon square is 864, 8,640. So what, what you have there is that the distances uh, in uh, inches and the speed uh, or so the distance something travels in miles, the moon travels its own diameter every uh, hour. So therefore, the moon in 24 hours is travel has travelled 51,840 miles. This two these two spheres here represent uh, time 
because the 432 spheres, uh, basically the area of those spheres uh, added together is 51.84. The angle of the Cheops pyramid is 51.84, uh, 518,400 seconds in the six days of creation. Times 60, you get arc seconds, which is uh, Brahma all time, which is your 311 trillion and 40 billion years for one rotation of our galaxy. Our society has gone backwards, not forwards. We've lost 80% of our language, we lost 80% of our maths, and uh, what I'm trying to do in my notes is bring back that lost knowledge. This is a, the, the uh, simplest form of uh, spiraling, opposing spirals, North Pole, South Pole, the concepts are very simple, but in applying those concepts, we can actually um, then uh, uh, move ahead yeah, into uh, implosive technologies that are working on the plasmoids, as I said, the Shamir, or you know, plasmoids 1957 Bostic, EVOs, uh, uh, Kenneth Radford Childers, uh, Shamir, as I said, with King Solomon, and then the, the, uh, uh, the vidrate, uh, from produced by the Vajra. Again, putting things in quadrature, which this machine does, and that quadrature means that you can fire these opposite, positive, negative, to positive, and negative, and actually create a spinning, uh, create a vortex, which creates like a hurricane, and that forms the, uh, on an equatorial plane, in 3D forms the uh, plasmoid structure. So I might just go to the slide presentation quickly. I, I don't know, can someone give me a time check? Five, oh, perfect, okay. So this is good. What I want to do is, is to introduce you to these concepts. And I do have a, uh, uh, a, uh, a set of slides that you can go to and follow up uh, on our uh, website. I think HowTube has a, HowTube Mouth will get you to a series of lectures, which I'd love you to be able to see. Obviously, uh, we've got time restricted, but um, the, this is, shows you the, uh, the uh, different um, section 15, the last one in this. It's about 10 hours of lectures, and I'd implore you to have a look at that. StrikeFoundation.Earth. Uh, you've got uh, the brilliant uh, summaries of that, which has been with our chemical science and uh, Jordan, and uh, obviously uh, uh, Cosmographica, the, the work with uh, uh, Randall, and uh, we've also got uh, the uh, um, Funny Old World with Johanna. And so there's a lot of people that are following up and summarizing this, but basically I'd implore you to have a look at this. And basically I go back to, and it's the, actually I, it was quoted as an Einstein quote, but apparently it's someone earlier than that, but it still goes, there's enough energy in a glass of water to boil the oceans of the world. Um, so basically, uh, when, the, when it goes into this machine, the plasmoids are net positive or net negative, and they structure the water. And that is a force amplification because you have the oxygen on the outside, which amplifies the negative charge. And then the, the, uh, uh, when you've got the hydrogen on the outside, it amplifies the positive charge. So, so it's, it's a it's, that's, I believe that's the mechanism. Solar balloon, star in the jar, 1934. I implore anyone that, that, def that can't understand how a simple bubbler can create uh, um, you know, uh, pressures and temperatures that are very extremely high, then I look at the uh, Oppenheimer and Schneider paper uh, in 1939, which, which shows that it's real science from the top scientists in the US government, from, as I said, from Oppenheimer, Schneider, you take it through. Um, and this is where I say these technologies have been suppressed actively. I'm being actively suppressed and threatened. So, but the point is, the main thing that people don't want anyone to know is the fact that these uh, plasmoid entities or these Shamir, uh, Vidrat, ball lightning are capable of altering matter and they are capable of storing uh, the Ark of the Covenant, storing an enormous amount of energy. If you take, as I said, the Kelps Pyramid, the area in cubits, 2.5, 1.5 times 1.5 of the actual Ark of the Covenant is actually 5.625 square cubits. Multiply that by uh, 64, you get 360 degrees. 
It's all related. Angles are related, time is related, uh, so that, you know, and uh, distance, time and distance, they're all in this unification model. For the universe to work, it has to be coherent. That's why uh, Sheila's work is so important, because if it's not coherent, things can't exist because they'll be extinguished. So, and, I, I, and I'd like to just take a thing, uh, to, uh, moment to thank uh, uh, Praveen Mohan, who's here, uh, for his work in, in, yeah, in actually uh, revealing uh, a lot of this ancient structures and a lot of this technology. I believe the, uh, uh, the Kalashi temple was cut from the top down with plasmoids, with advanced technology, and the VARS work has uh, helped uh, uh, do that. So I suppose I'm, uh, I'm out of time, I'm out of slides. So um, thank you very much for everyone to come. And I do uh, thank you for your time. And I really appreciate the support you guys have been giving us. And also, as I said, standing on the shoulders of giants, trying to get the science right, trying to introduce plasmoids to the world and trying to get the world off uh, implosive uh, so explosive technology onto implosive and with the thunderstorm generator I think we'll prove in the next couple of days that this does the job but the direct matter to energy drive is where this is headed so and uh, I'll be giving talks on that but I thought the main thing was you came to see the machine and an explanation of how I got to where I am it's 50 years work and if you read my notes uh, they're all color coded and it, it is rewriting mass physics and chemistry so Anyway, so thank you for your time again. Thank you.